Hi, Pet the Podcast Editors here. A wise man views mistakes as costly lessons. And in today's episode, the boys explain some common mistakes made in the world of business with some real world examples. Blockbuster. They didn't innovate. And Netflix came along, saw a gap in the market and offered something that the customers actually wanted. Digital would have changed Blockbuster's business for sure, but it wasn't the killer. That credit belongs to Blockbuster itself. And Lloyd exposes Dan for being a Karen and writing a list of complaints at their local sports club. Can we please take the bog brush off the shower windowsill? Also, why is there a dog bowl in the shower? Can we hire cleaners to clean the sauna, please? You could also send a questionnaire out to ask members for other ways to improve the club. Just a suggestion. Now, before we dive in, we'd like to take a second to thank our sponsors, Adobe Express. Adobe Express allows you to quickly and easily create standout social graphics, logos, flyers, and more on web and mobile. Click the link in the description to try Adobe Express today. Right, let's get stuck in. This is episode 146 of the Business Anchors podcast. We're just a couple of business anchors. Welcome to the Business Anchors podcast. This jingle is slightly too long. This jingle is slightly too long. What mistakes are marketers and founders making? And what incredibly interesting, entertaining and insightful stories do you have to share to reinforce the points you're making, Lloyd? Well, I can I can tell you the mistakes they're making, but I can assure you I will not be entertaining or informative or educational. We'll try, try your no, best. No, I will really. We both will. This is going to be a, this is going to be a really good episode. I can tell. Yes. Because when I was um, thinking about it and preparing, because we actually we actually prepare for this podcast yes. and put a lot of work into it, I was there, there's a lot of stuff that was interesting me, uh, <laughs> and hopefully. <laughs> That will interest. I think there's a lot of listeners. interesting stories and real life examples of things that we've got to share with you that are going to stop you making some terrible mistakes with your marketing. Yeah. And the first thing we're going to talk about, Dan, yep. is not getting complacent and neglecting your current customers, which is absolutely massive. And so many businesses do this. Even big boys, uh, big, big boys, um, <laughs> even big businesses um that we've all heard of have done it and failed but loads of small and medium businesses do it as well um and we've got a bit of a bit of an example i think to learn some lessons from a local business to us that we we visit a lot dan we've been speaking a lot about this yes and And yeah. No, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, Dan. Go ahead. I was ahead. just going to say you, you. We've both been speaking and complaining and talking a lot about this, and I think the anchors might find it interesting to hear about yeah. this story. So, there's a local sports club, Dan, isn't there? Yes. That we frequent r- <laughs> a, uh, frequent. a lot. <laughs> I would say we're there three times a week. Yeah, we are there three times weeks. a week, and we won't name and shame them. No, we could do. They'll never listen to this, but. Um, Dan uh, has got so upset with the, how they're treating their current customers, paying customers, <laughs> that he wrote a uh, note <laughs> on a little whiteboard on an easel and put it in the um, entrance hall uh, of uh, the uh, sports club. No, no. Let's, let's get the facts right. The whiteboard was already on the easel in the sports club. I just wrote on it. Okay. Right. I, I just need to briefly rant on why that notice board's there. Um, because this sports club is so badly run, um, there are about 12 notice boards in the sports club. But because no notices have been taken down since 1982, they're all full of completely irrelevant old <laughs> notices. So now an easel has been uh, put in front of the doorway. So, so, you know, oh, I know all the other notice boards are shit and you don't need to pay attention to them. But this one you do. Yeah. And then there's nothing on it. So Dan's written this. Yeah. Okay. Um <laughs> I would say Dan probably wrote it in this voice. But also, this was the second version that I toned down. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I felt bad. Okay. I wrote a dip- yeah, go on. So um, we might have an image we can put on screen, but can we please take the bog brush off the shower windowsill? Also, why is there a dog bowl in the shower? Can we hire cleaners to clean the sauna, please? You could also send a questionnaire out to ask members for other ways to improve the club. Just a suggestion. <laughs> I think that final just a suggestion, that passive aggressive bit at the I'm end. I'm sorry. Right. Is, is, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. Anchors listening. Mm. If you were if you were a paying member of, a, of some kind of club 
and there was a dirty bog brush on the side of a shower <laughs> that was there. And then you, you came to the club a few times a week and it hadn't moved for weeks. <laughs> Is that acceptable? I, I have to agree. Right, number one. It's not acceptable. Right. Second thing. Mm. In the in the shower where members are getting showered and cleaned and stuff, That's is it I mean. is it acceptable for there to be a dog bowl in there where people <laughs> can just bring their dogs to to drink water out of the showers? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It is. I mean, I feel I'm slightly immune because we go to this sports club so often, but it is absolutely mental when you think about it. Also, um, in the showers. Uh, I'm really painting a picture for you, business hackers. <laughs> really imagine this. So uh, imagine all the tiles being slightly mouldy, firstly. Um, imagine they're only clean twice a week. So if you go on a Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday or Sunday, there's just like manky fluff from people's socks all over the floor. That's right. Imagine that first. Um, but now imagine, it's true. It's true. oh, there's a bit of a, an issue with some piping. That needs to be repaired. So someone... I can only say before 2017 when I joined, thought that pipe needs to move slightly. Um, should we get a plumber in? Actually, no. I'll just get a knife from the kitchen and wedge it behind it <laughs> between a tile and the pipe to keep that tile there. And I will just leave it there for six years. <laughs> because it was there when I joined in 2017 and it's still there. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I suppose the <laughs> a bit of a relevant example to me and Dan that we're uh, you know, we're not bothered about it at all. But there's, not, lo there's, not bothered, lo just there's lots of lessons to learn from this, I think. Lots of lessons. And we've been speaking a lot about this. Yeah. Well, one question, Dan. We're talking about, right, don't get complacent and let down your current customers, which we're saying this mm. anonymous local sports club is, is doing to us. Yeah. Um, why are we still customers there? Customers? Members? Whatever you want to call it. Uh, personally, I think it's all down to convenience. and, and Well, no, con convenience and options. So I'd say, uh, again, I don't want to go into specifics of what the sports club is about, but um, there's only a couple of options, I think, in our area. The, uh, the mm. next one is probably, the current one is is probably 10 minutes drive mm. from my house, two minutes from yours. Yeah. The next one is probably 25, 30 minute drive. Mm. So it's the convenience of it's the closest one for us both to and go to. Do you know what? I think this is really common for a lot of businesses. So... Businesses get complacent because there's some kind of limiting factor with their customers of like, it's, oh, we have to do business with these this business or like, oh, it's just more convenient at this point in time. But they get complacent. And then because I, I, I made a joke while we we're in the showers the other day, Dan, we we're in separate cubicles. <laughs> yeah. Just, just uh, imagine that. Um, <laughs> no clothes on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and in my cubicle, just so you know, on the window sill where the bog brush was a few weeks ago, there was a tissue with some substance on <laughs> that had been there for multiple weeks um, and an apple sticker stuck on a tile next to it. <laughs> that confused me. Well, who's eating an apple in the shower? No. Um, the, the good thing, though, the, right, the good thing about the, this kind of the not being cleaned and stuff yeah. or not being sorted out... <laughs> If you, if you leave your shampoo there, yeah. next time you come, the shampoo's still there. Next time you come back to the... Yes, that is good. But the only thing is also, if you do a turd in the shower, the next time the turd's still there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you've had that problem. Swings around about. Um, yeah, why why anyway, do you think sorry, going? I was saying, yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is a common thing. We're talking about this in the shower. Yeah. And I kind of joked, well, when we make our own anonymous sports club in a couple of years... Um, these guys are going to lose all their customers. And I think this is the thing. Like, if you're being complacent at the moment because for some reason it's convenient or the only option for your customers, as soon as there is any other option, yep, they will gone. have no question, loyalty or doubt or anything in just going, oh, I'm definitely moving yep. right now. Like, if there was a clean anonymous sports club doing the same thing, like, that's yep. all it has to be. Yep. It just has to be clean. I would immediately get a membership there. Here's an exact example of this happening recently. Mm. My gym. So I used to go uh, about a couple of years ago, a a gym opened up that was like a 24 hour low cost gym. Yeah. That uh, previously your other options were a lot more costly mm. and uh, that it wasn't a rolling monthly contract. But a new one came to Thanet and opened up. It was a completely new thing. Low cost, rolling contract. Thought, mm. great, put, works perfectly for me. Signed up. Over two years they basically neglected to 
um, do anything to improve the the gym. Uh, didn't focus on like making it good or enjoyable. When and you I, go in there, the the uh, fitness trainers are just on their phone yeah. and stuff like that. So you over. I bet the big wigs as well, looking at the spreadsheets with and like getting more membership. Like, stuff. oh god, this one's making a great profit. Yeah. Like they they're just thinking. Well, it's doing this, well. this is doing great because this is making lots of profit. Great. The reason, because there was no other 24-hour gym at that mm. price point in the local area, yeah. right, for two years. So yeah. I was a member then. It was, I just, it was all right. It was just yeah. all right. Uh, about three months ago, a new pure gym opened up. Yeah. Right. Same concept, 24 hours. Went to try it out. Um, much, a wider variety of, of uh, equipment. They've got hair dryers in the toilet. Nicer quality fitted out. Yeah. Um, I moved there immediately and it was like eight quid cheaper a month. Yeah. And all the people I used to see in my previous gym have moved there now. And and yeah. I've seen that the uh, the old gym have now tried to suddenly say they're getting more equipment and stuff yeah. to try and save yeah. it. But it's because they became complacent. And so obviously, for some reason, Dan and I love ranting about random sports clubs and, gym, <laughs> and gyms. Um, but I think this is a huge lesson. Like... Your if you if your business is getting complacent and not looking after its customers in the way it should, that business could disappear overnight. If you're doing this sort of thing, just like we're saying, my anonymous sports club and your gym. Yeah. If once a competitor comes along down the road that's actually just doing the basics, like oh that's yeah. good, this one doesn't have a bo- a dirty bog brush <laughs> yeah. on the windowsill. Yeah. Oh, that's good that there's not random dog bowls in the shelves. <laughs> yeah. Um, bonus <laughs> yeah and i think uh, the key thing to learn here i think you've got to get back to basics and make sure you're doing the basics for your um for your customers really well there's like a lot of people when it gets to this point of like so say you, well i make toothbrushes and then a the toothbrush competitor comes along that does it 10p cheaper per toothbrush and then then it's like oh crap Oh yeah, we haven't really. We just thought that would sell forever. Let's um, let's add a button on our toothbrush that sings a song, and then <laughs> the, these businesses they try and do these weird things to to like save oh, gimmicky let's, things. Quick, let's let's make this toothbrush turn green if you press the green button. <laughs> like so, things that don't add anything, yeah. like gimmicks. Rather than going back to basics and going, oh shit, we haven't been giving our customers, our valued customers, a really good quality, good value product. And this is so our anonymous sports club, Mm -hmm. we'll stop talking about it in a minute. They keep going, oh God, memberships are down again this year. What we probably need, and you'll you'll recognize this, Dan, for some reason, (laughs) they think if they create random events with alliteration Literation, in the yeah. titles, <laughs> it's going to say the club. Friday fish and so, yeah. freebies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's do a pizza party and prawns. <laughs> and you're like, firstly... And they, they write it on the notice board as well, yeah. that I wrote on yeah. to, to promote it. They, oh, within the club, so new members yeah. can't... New they think people are going to go in and go, oh, it's a bit rubbish that there's that horrible tissue that's been there for eight months with an unknown substance on it right where I have to clean myself. But at least there's the <laughs> the beers, baguettes and bull bags party <laughs> later. Like that, it doesn't make any sense. And I think although like oh, we're using Sonic a really bad true. example, in customer experience, like you have to cover the basics before you do the whole surprise and yeah. delight and and really wow your customers. <laughs> There's no point trying to wow your customers at the same time as not doing the basics. Yeah. And in customer experience as well, there's the whole thing of attracting new customers. And so for this example, that's like getting new members, like trying to do these <laughs> beer baguettes and ball bags parties <laughs> yeah. um, with alliteration that uh, is not needed. So like, oh, let's attract new yeah. members. Um, but then once you've attracted them, you need to engage them yeah. in a way that they're going to stay customers and then you need to then you need to get to the like surprising and delighting them. Then making thinking, then making thinking, then thinking like, wow, this is a really cool place to be a customer of. And then they tell their friends and family, and they put reviews online, going, "This is amazing." And then that helps you attract new customers. But if you just go straight to trying to do the surprise and delight with weird gimmicks, and you're not doing the basics, mm. it's never going to work. So the focus should initially be those basic things, like. Yeah. The, make the club clean. Yeah. Uh, remove dirty bog brushes and things. Yeah. 
uh, you know, clean the sauna as a starting point. Because if, if you do attract new members, their first experience is going to be rubbish and then yeah. they're not going to want to stay. Exactly. They won't stay and they won't help you attract any more members. If you do all the basics right and you engage them properly and they're really happy with the service or the product and then you delight them with some really cool mm. stuff, then they'll help you get new new members and customers. And with our example, this anonymous sports club that we will stop talking about, mm. I promise, um, like it's a group of lovely people that run it. Yeah. So like, I want to be loyal. Like, and mm. it's it's almost like, if there's a new shiny anonymous sports club down the road, I want I don't want to go there. Like, if you just clean this one, <laughs> I'll stay because you're really lovely and it's a yeah. nice community, and I want to support mm. it. But you, you can't just trouble though. The trouble is, mm. we've both given feedback. And I think you've sent a Karen email to them as well. Oh, I wasn't going to mention my Karen email. You sent a Karen email. Um, and we, uh, we've we both tried to give feedback to say, because I think the, the number one thing they should do is just, um, is is survey members. Like, so that mm. so they know it's not just us. Mm. Survey current members. What could we do to improve the club? What don't you like about the club? What do you like about the club? Then they'll get all the feedback to know, they'll have the actual data from members to see what they should be doing. Currently, you give feedback and it's like, yeah, well... You know, it's a members run club, so you should be doing everything. Really, I gave feedback about the uh, the tissue with the anonymous substance that was left there for literally months. Yeah, which is weird. Um, even though it's supposed to be cleaned. Yeah, and they just sent an email out to all members saying, "It's really your responsibility to clean up after yourselves, guys." <laughs> that was kind of, like, but surely the cleaners should at least pick that up. Though. <laughs> yeah. Like if the, if a member yeah. hasn't. So, so right. So, so trying to make it actionable mm. for anchors. If an anchor's listening, they've got a business, they're a founder or they work in a business and they want to ensure it survives and thrives mm -hmm. and they don't want to become complacent. What actual action steps can they take to ensure that they're not becoming complacent? Do, should they do like an audit first of all or something? Or is there some, you yeah. know, what should they do? I, I think um, they should be asking current customers for feedback. And if you're, uh, maybe you already sell loads of products and you can actually just analyze the data in your reviews and stuff. But like, don't just think our profits are looking good. And because I, I think a lot of businesses are like, oh, the reviews are going a bit down here. We had a big client like this that was turning over tens of millions in the UK and hundreds of millions worldwide. And we noticed that their reviews were going downhill. And it's kind of like, oh, the product seems like it's it's not as good a quality as it used to be. Because we, we're looking at these patterns and we brought it up. But because profits were looking great and turnover was looking great, the right things weren't done. And then they had a, a downturn in turnover and profits because they didn't do anything about it. So I think firstly, it's making sure you're, you're understanding what your customers feel and doing something about it, even if the you know profit and that kind of stuff is looking mm. good at the moment. Um, but I think, like you said, some kind of audit, looking at competitors... So it may be that your business in, is in great shape now, but if there's a competitor or someone new coming up that you're thinking their customers look happier than ours, mm. um, then at some point that's going to be an issue for you. When when it's, um, when people are looking to buy a new product or renew their membership, whatever business you're, it might be, they're going to at least consider that one. And it looks yeah. like that one's got better reviews or it looks like that one's better value. So mm. you need to change that before your customers reconsider their spending for me i think a big alarm bell for you anchor listening is if you thanks lord if you um haven't done anything to innovate or improve your business in you know if you can't think of something specific you thought oh we've done this to improve that or we've done mm. this to improve that then that's a big alarm bell that you're just getting complacent and just carrying yeah. on as you always always have done yeah right dan i want to move on to the second mm. point this is, and it's a good segue into it it really follows it on nicely. The second thing that I think founders of businesses should really avoid is um, focusing too much on what's worked for your business in the past and not innovating and adapting to changes or technology or new trends. And like, obviously what we've been saying already leads mm. really nicely into this. And I think it's really important. Yeah. I think like if you think about big examples of, of companies that have got it wrong, Blockbuster. Yeah. So do you remember when we used to go to Blockbuster and pick a video to watch in yeah. our VHF? VHS yeah. or VHF? VHS VHS, VHS are 
the uh, the knockoff version of like Smurf Ice used to get. An oh yeah, sorry, VHS. Yeah, VHS, yeah. Yeah, so you used to go to a blockbuster, pick a video mm-hmm. out, and take it home. And and I I honestly used to love that experience. I think mm-hmm. a lot of people did. Like, but the trouble um, with blockbuster is they didn't innovate. So when yeah. Netflix came about, previous love previously love film. Mm. Uh, they saw a gap in the market for people that didn't want to have to go out and walk to a store to, to, to rent a movie. They saw a gap in the market. I think they started sending out DVDs when Netflix was love film, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, I remember. Do you I remember? was a customer, yeah. Getting DVDs in the post and then you sent them back. So that was the first step of making mm. it more convenient for customers. I didn't have to walk to the local blockbuster. I could just yeah. go online. I want to rent this movie. They'll send it to you in the post. Great. Mm-hmm. The next version of that was Netflix where... You just signed up and clicked a button and you could instantly have a movie. Um, and the trouble with Blockbuster is they they didn't innovate. They didn't change their offering. And, and Netflix came along, saw a gap in the market and offered yeah. something that the cu- customers actually wanted and killed off Blockbuster. So I think even um, Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix at yeah. one point in the early days and they, yeah. they declined it. There's also, I've got a quote from the former marketing communications leader at Blockbuster. They said... Um, Digital would have changed Blockbuster's business for sure, but it wasn't the killer. That credit belongs to Blockbuster itself. Because basically Blockbuster mm-hmm. were big enough just to do what Netflix was doing. Like mm-hmm. there was nothing they couldn't have done. They were far, a far bigger business that had more funds available. They could have just gone, okay, let's take on that model. But they chose not to innovate. And they thought, yeah. like we're saying about looking at your spreadsheets, like we're making <laughs> millions. Yeah. Like We're all right. We don't need to change. And obviously, Blockbuster doesn't exist because they they chose not to innovate. Do you know what I feel like right now? An example of this happening right now is mm. is to do with AI. Right. I've seen lots of people um, set, like talking about AI as if it's like a new fad and like, mm. oh yeah, it's you know, there's no there's no point using it and let's stick to what we've always stuck to. Okay. I think that the companies that aren't embracing AI now are going to be in a similar position to Blockbuster and end up not improving not delivering better services and um, getting overtaken by the competitors. Yeah. I saw another uh, big big company we were looking at. I think, did you did you look into BlackBerry as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because I... Um, BBM, interesting. anyone remember Yeah, that? BlackBerry, obviously, depending on your age, like some people know BlackBerry phones, like especially for people in business, it was like, oh, this is great. I can do my emails on my phone. And um, they're another one who just basically chose not to innovate. And um, I had thought, a, sorry, I was gonna say, do you remember the QWERTY keyboard? That yeah. was like then, like yeah, being that able was to type thing. every letter. You can a... type, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, I found a really good example of how again they chose not to innovate because they were like, we're mm. in a good place. In 2014, BlackBerry were working on a Siri-like voice assistant called BlackBerry Assistant. A full three years after Apple had already integrated Siri into all of their devices. So yeah. it's like, obviously, at some point they were like, yeah. oh, shit, okay, yeah, we better start innovating. It's too late, isn't but it? But it's far too late. Three years they were starting the work on it. Mm. And, um, and yeah, but they went from, like, having the biggest market share to, in 2016, 2016 had 0.2% of the market. I remember ha- getting so excited to get the latest BlackBerry phone yeah. when we were kids and stuff. And yeah. then now, where's it gone? Yeah. Down the drain. Another big, can I give you a third and final on, big example? Kodak. Mm-hmm. They use, in like photography. The camera company, right? Yeah, they, they were like, did everything with photography. Mm. Photography. F- photography. Mm. Like cameras, printing, and mm. everything. To do with They that. were like the big boys. And in 1975, they developed the first digital camera. Mm. But basically, they developed it and thought, yeah, this is far better than what we're doing with like analog and again, depending on your age, you'll know from like winding the cameras and doing it on film oh, and yeah. stuff. Um, but they were basically worried that it would cannibalize that they had a great business. They're like, this is better for customers, but we, we're making shit loads of money with yeah. it not being digital. So they basically just um, held it back. Mm. And you know, it was a better offering to their customers. Yeah. And then eventually other businesses came forward with digital and just, yeah, took the thing rather than Kodak cannibalizing its mm. own business, they just took all of their customers. The trouble is, though, it's easier to carry on and and do what you've always done. Mm. Like it's more difficult to to look at yourself in detail and and change what you're doing. Yeah. 
So the easier option is to just continue. That's why a lot of people yeah. do that and then fail when other companies yeah. who are more hungry to succeed innovate. And that leads us nicely into the, to the next point that we want to talk about: making decisions to gain short-term reward rather than long-term, much bigger rewards. Yeah. Um, which is another massive thing. Like, and again, I think it's that thing with both massive corporations that are like trying to keep their shareholders happy like this quarter rather than like for the next mm. 10 years or whatever like oh well we need this to look good in this monthly report to like businesses like ours to like very small businesses that maybe there's like two employees and a business owner and that business owner is making short-term decisions of taking the profit out of the business rather than reinvesting mm. i think it's really commonplace across lots of different sizes i think we've noticed this we've spoken about this a lot um, I think it, it's difficult. It depends where you are in your journey as a business though. Mm. I'd say when we started out in business, we were making a lot more decisions based on short term. Mm. So for, I'll give you one example, uh, how picky we were with who we worked with. Yeah. When we started and we had no customers, mm. we would work with anyone because for the short term, we were like, we need to make this business a success. Yeah. We need to get some level of income. So anyone that would want to work with us, we'd immediately work with. No matter how stressful or how good or bad a fit they were for a company, we were like, if you've got a problem that we could potentially solve, we will work with you. Mm. However, now, much further down the line with a lot more experience under our belt, we know that there's certain companies that are much better aligned with what we do. Mm. Um, you know, there's certain alarm bells we can see with potential customers that could cause our team unnecessary stress. Mm. And we're a lot more picky with who we work with because we know for the long term, it's better off that we work with companies that are more aligned with us, that we can do a better job for, mm. that our team will enjoy working with more. And th there's a number of examples recently where we've we've turned down things that in the short term would be very lucrative for us, but we know they'd put unnecessary mm. stress on our team. And there was those alarm bells there. So I think it depends where you are in your journey as to mm. how you're making those decisions. There's also when like when we're starting out, there was a number of like sort of digital marketing businesses popping up in our local area at the same time as us. Mm. And I think thinking back now, a lot of them don't exist or are still at the level where it's sort of just the founders of the company and they're almost kind of freelancers, yeah. you know what I mean? And haven't grown. And I think that's definitely down to us making more long-term choices from the start how why do you think that is like why did we have that long-term mindset because i don't think that's just was just like inbuilt in us i don't know like why did we think longer term well i think at first in the first few months maybe we didn't i know there were some things where even internally between us um i remember we we're trying to work out finance stuff and there was a point i hope you don't mind me saying this where like you were doing some work that was kind of for a higher paid client and I was doing much lower paid work. Yeah. And you were kind of like, okay, so I should earn that much and you should earn that, right? <laughs> and like small decisions like that. And now we would always be like, well, no, that only makes sense like this week. We're not thinking <laughs> yeah. of the longer term, yeah. like of what's the point of taking that fi out financially mm. out of the business and stuff. But I think we kind of very early, we we had the long-term vision of like, okay, let's think about what we want for the next like 10, 20 years mm. rather than just creating ourselves a job now that would be the same forever. I think I also, something that I think made us think longer term is seeing examples of other companies thinking short term mm. and like uh, offering services for a le very low cost to attract lots of customers, but then seeing the issues that came from that. Yeah. Like, spending every hour under the sun working mm. and then not earning a huge amount and being stressed and like seeing those examples mm. sort of made I us think, think. Pro, like one of the best things we've ever done in business is making shit loads of shit content <laughs> that <laughs> sounds weird go on but like we we were investing huge amounts of time and resource <laughs> such a little sound bite <laughs> into making content that looking back was shit and 13 people saw <laughs> do you know what i mean like the amount of time we put into some youtube videos that yeah. got 17 views <laughs> but i think if we were thinking in the short term you would look at that and not make the youtube video the next week yeah but we we were thinking in the long term and the benefit of creating that shit content for months and probably a couple of years 
was that we were learning that whole time yeah. and that got us to the point we are today we've continued learning continued creating better stuff like if we tried to create a podcast in 2016 mm. it would have been so shit <laughs> but i'm confident if we started a podcast in 2017 this podcast would be much bigger than it yeah. is now more successful because we would have learned even more yeah i think that's a really good point like ha having that longer term mindset of because even this podcast right so for the first year of starting this, we started in February, 2020. We, we, we didn't make much money from it and it didn't attract many new customers and it wasn't working out. However, we saw those small incremental improvements mm -hmm. over time. We saw the listeners growing, the downloads growing. Like we saw that data that showed us that this was on the journey to getting to a point where yeah. we wanted to. And we didn't give up in those it's early like days. It's like that com compounding effect as well. Mm -hmm. Like adding someone in our kind of audience in 2017 um led to might have led to 30 people in our audience in 2023 because of the reviews that they've left and people they're telling do you know what i mean yeah. like we focus on those small things and i think we spoke about some of our kind of competitors in kent when we started and i think a lot of them i've seen over the years creating content and getting 13 views and i've seen some of them even like starting out on tiktok and doing the same thing yeah but then you see them pop up doing it getting disheartened when they get 13 views yeah. and stop whereas i think you you have to be quite confident because we we still you know try different types of content and stuff and that will get it'll be really underwhelming yeah for our business but it's the confidence to go okay let's learn from that yeah next week we're gonna get 23 views let's learn from that the week after we're gonna get 100 the week after we're gonna get 10 it's 000. not the worrying what other people think will think of you as well yeah like I, I feel comfortable that we c we could try something completely new on a different platform and get five views, and I would still feel yeah. like okay, we've learned something from that rather than um, yo, let's give up and we're rubbish. You know, a lot of people it's are scared. Like, oh, what if I post something that only gets five views? I'll look rubbish. It's like yeah. no, you're trying and testing and learning. That's how you have it's success. Unbelievable, with marketing. unbelievable how powerful it is putting time in making shit stuff and learning from it. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, like it's it's been one of the most important things for our business re on reflection yeah if we'd have gone that was shit that didn't really work let's stop yeah it just wouldn't have worked and if anyone wants to see that shit stuff just look back at our youtube channel from like 2015 or 16 yeah. or whatever there is some real terrible stuff on there yeah <laughs> so moral of the story do loads of shit stuff <laughs> <laughs> something else we didn't do which i think is a is a big lesson um, that we've now learned is getting more feedback. And I think mm. that this is one of the, another key uh, mistake that people make that we made yeah. is not getting feedback early on enough. Yeah. Cause it's scary. Like if you, if you just carry on with your head in the sand, not knowing that customers aren't happy mentally, it's far easier than saying, are you happy? And then going, well, to be honest, no, not really. Or like, mm. I'm really happy with this part, but this product yeah. that you sent me, it just feels a bit cheaper than I hoped yeah. or, you know, whatever that is, I think. And this, like, like you said, Dan, this is something we're still trying to do more of in business, but I think so many businesses don't do this and they just carry yeah. on regardless and think, Oh, let's just not bother asking even more recently. So here's a real life example. So recently in our business, I think I, what, what we, we do with customers is ask them at the end of the process center survey, you know, how did it all go? Give us some feedback. Mm -hmm. What I think, we didn't do well enough was kind of account management of frequently getting that feedback on an ongoing basis. And this was my mm. responsibility to, to ensure they're happy. And now, um, even recently we've um, improved our process to make sure I'm checking in with customers throughout the project to see how things are going. Mm. So that if they may have a small thing that they're like, Oh, actually it's going well, but there's one thing that I think could be improved slightly. Mm. We have that information earlier on in the project can take action and then it's improved for the rest of the project rather than just thinking something small yeah. in the back of their mind and that compounding over time, we can get that feedback early on. So yeah, we definitely recommend doing that. I think a lot of people in business get defensive and kind of, well, well, they don't know what they're talking about, that customer or whatever, you know, they're wrong or whatever. But I found a really good kind of table to use that splits feedback into four categories. So I'm going to share that yeah, with go you on. now. Go on. So you've got basically a scale of positive and negative feedback along the y-axis yep. and inaccurate and accurate feedback along the x-axis because sometimes you will get feedback that just isn't accurate because people haven't understood 
your service properly or what you're supposed to get or they haven't read the details of what they bought but i have to admit i think a lot more of the time it is accurate so yeah. keep that in mind don't get too defensive but so if you get positive and inaccurate feedback it says ignore that's a difficult one to ignore like like <laughs> I, I, you have to be really critical here so if we've had this a couple of times where i kind of think oh i th- i think we could have done better there and the the customer is absolutely ecstatic because we've really exceeded their yeah. expectation i suppose internally i know we can do even yeah. better but the customer's really really happy which is obviously a good thing and i think so so yeah basically you should be ignoring it and it says while flattering you don't learn anything from this feedback yeah like what's the point of going oh yes and kind of knowing in the back of your mind we could have done better we could have done better then you've got the positive and accurate and it says celebrate say thanks save the moment and add it to your brag sheet to kind of add it to somewhere where you like yeah we can use that to tell our we other have a, customers and we have a slack channel that whenever mm-hmm. anyone think one gets anything positive and accurate we'll put into that slack channel so we can yeah. look back and see what people don't think forget of. to do that don't i think some businesses are good at getting feedback and just focus on the negative like oh we need to improve that that's negative whereas we're saying if it's positive and accurate feedback celebrate reinforce that positive that behavior. feels good yeah and then if it's inaccurate and negative again ignore this might say more about the person giving the feedback yeah how do you know though that i guess you have to be really critical and really try yes. and because i'd want to just ignore all the negative stuff but i think, I, was it, I think it's about being brutally honest with mm. yourselves is there any truth behind what they're saying yeah i think if you're brutally br- brutally honest with yourselves and you're empathetic to that customer so you think yeah. if i was in their shoes how would i be feeling yeah then you'll know if it's inaccurate or accurate but you've got to be honest with yourselves. I also think even if it is inaccurate, you've still got to think like that's your customer mm. and them being happy with working with you is important. Yeah. So is there some, it, look, look inwards, that feedback may be inaccurate, but is there something that I could have improved on? Mm. Maybe it's through our communication, communicating something better so that they wouldn't be providing that inaccurate feedback. I think don't yeah. just discount something that's inaccurate feedback. They're still unhappy. Yeah. You still need to understand why are they unhappy you know it may be that in the pitching process you weren't accurate enough with managing expectations and that kind of thing so don't just discount it completely i think try and still look inwards yeah and finally i think the the type of feedback that can be most impactful for any business is the accurate and negative like we said if it's positive we want to celebrate but accurate and negative basically means you should plan and implement so use it as a chance to learn and do better and this is how businesses improve. This is how businesses grow because you look at what hasn't gone right, what isn't perfect, and you make improvements. If things don't go perfectly and you just don't make any changes, your business will always be delivering the same level. And because the world moves forward and your competitors move forward, you'll actually be moving backwards. Yeah. It's a really good point. Nice table, Lloyd. Thank you. It's not mine. So credit goes to Dr. Nicole Chiespiski. <laughs> sorry for my uh pronunciation nice so F- is there any th- more things people should avoid i was gonna say final point yeah comes from me go on i think it's really important it's, it's only a quick one though but not neglecting yourself as a business owner or as kind of a leader in business wait avoid not neglecting yourself avoid not oh so hang on these are the things you shouldn't do yeah neglect yourself okay there you go <laughs> so so don't neglect yourself yeah yeah what do you mean by that? Well, I was looking into data and a lot of businesses fail in the early stages due to the owner or founder losing motivation or the ability to continue. Right. And I think a lot of this, again, looking into data on health of founders of businesses and leaders in businesses, it's people really working hard, not looking after themselves to a point where they can't continue or they kind of mentally lose the strength to continue because like, Okay, now how long can I do this for? These yeah. crazily long days and not seeing my family. I think being a business owner, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and so I think looking after your mental and physical health, even if it slows down growth in the short term, we spoke about focusing on the long term anyway, um, I think is really important. And one thing uh, that I was looking into when I looked at the data on health of business founders a big thing is stress so 49 percent of founders report high stress levels 
whereas wow. 35% of employees um, mm. report high stress levels. So there's quite a significant increase on stress. And um, I would say if you're just, if you're like that founder, it's just like, well, yeah, you know, it's business. It's get stressful and just yeah. deal with it. Yeah. I like I was really looking into this and looking at the like health wise long term and stuff and stress if it continues you know longer than a couple of days like has major long term mm. negative effects on your health like your body ages early if you have stress yeah. like in the long term and it causes so many heart issues so I think I don't know just even if you're young try and think mm. if you're going to have months and years of feeling stressed it's probably overall going to make your life worse, even if you're thinking like there might be a financial benefit or other benefits in the short term. Something I found useful recently, on the Whoop Band, we've spoken, spoken about fitness trackers mm. before. They now track stress as a metric. It's yeah. quite a new thing, yeah. which I guess is a, for me, is a, is a good thing to keep an eye on it because you can actually have the data to, in, to, to know how mm. stressed, you know, like sometimes you think, I feel yeah. stressed. This will actually tell you how, how often you're yeah. low, medium or high stress throughout I, the day. I think it also gives you some kind of, um input on oh if you're at a high stress level it talks about breath work and meditation and i used to kind of think like yeah but, well, you know what does that do but it, it genuinely you know there's data behind it if you do meditate or do some breath work you can get your stress because i mean stress is like a physical thing happening in mm. your body it isn't just a feeling of i feel stressed there are things happening physically within your body yeah. that you can stop by doing things like meditating and breath mm. work and resting so that you can do something about it without having to just stop working. Have you used any like apps or anything that are good for that or any like I I a couple of years ago I downloaded that Headspace app for meditation oh. and stuff but I I personally mm. don't. Um I've listened to like the kind of Wim Hof audio book and like mm. on some breath work and stuff that I use mm. sometimes and things like that. Um do you use any apps or anything? No. No. Okay. <laughs> no, no oh. I'm just interested. I don't. Yeah. No, no. No. Um Speaking of reducing stress, Lloyd. Yeah. Can I just before we end? Can I share a really cool way that podcasters can use Descript, Chat GPT, and our podcast sponsors, Adobe Express, to create some really cool content? Yes. If that's going to relieve some stress for me and other anchors, then it will go for it. Um. So we've been really trying and testing lots of different cool ways to to utilize Adobe Express with other tools like Chat GPT, and this is quite a niche one for people that have their own podcast. Um, but I guess it doesn't have to be people with their own podcast. It could be people that create written content. Yeah, okay. So one of the cool ways that you can use the script chat GPT and Adobe Ex Express is to create LinkedIn document posts that have 2.2 .2 to 3.4 times the reach of a standard text-based post. And we've spoken about how you can do this before in other ways. But there's a really clever thing you can do. So, so firstly, um, there's a tool called Descript that really quickly and easily helps you transcribe audio. So this is why it's perfect for podcasts because you can uh, transcribe the audio from a, po a podcast. So mm -hmm. you've got the written version. Then you can write a prompt in ChatGPT um, to summarize that podcast episode into seven key takeaways. Okay. And you can go as basic or advanced as you want. So you can ask it to um, do it in a certain tone of voice. You can input um, other copy that you've written in your tone of voice and ask it to write it in that tone of voice. So mm -hmm. there's, there's lots of different variations you can use, but use the script to get the transcription. You ask ChatGPT to, to summarize the seven key takeaways from that podcast episode. Then you can head over to Adobe Express and create um, like a beautifully designed LinkedIn document post using the thousands of templates that you, on each of the different pages of the LinkedIn document post, you can share the key takeaways. So you could have like mm. seven key takeaways from this episode mm. with a call to action at the end. And we've been testing these on our, and posting them on LinkedIn and they've been doing incredibly well. Um, so yeah, to summarize, get the transcript of your podcast on the script, use chat GPT to get the key takeaways, then use Adobe Express to create a beautifully designed LinkedIn document post. And it's proven to get 2.2 .2 to 3.4 times the reach of a standard text-based post. Oh, I'll, I'll do that now. Go and do it now, Lloyd. Oh, but if I'm going to do that, we should probably end this episode. Yes. Yeah, let's do that. Um, but just before we go, Dan, what, what are we going to be talking about next week? Do you remember? Uh, we are good. Oh, I can't I'll remember. On the spot. What are we talking about next week? We're talking about marketing lessons learned from tracking millions of pounds in online oh, sales. Yes, we are. So because we have spent millions um, or our clients have spent millions in 
uh, ad revenue mm. and got millions of pounds of sales mm. over the years. Um, we've learned a lot of lessons and we want to share those with you from that kind of paid social campaign point of view. Yeah. So I think a lot of useful lessons for you to come back to business anchors. And then remember the final thing that people need to do um, people think that these podcasts are free to listen to, but remember they're not. Oh no, they're not, are they? There's the gentleman's agreement that we stole from uh, another podcast. Yes. Where people have to subscribe. That's their payment yes. for listening to this for free, yeah. right? So I hope you've enjoyed that. Here's your bill, sir, madam. Yep. Um, if you wouldn't mind paying that bill, uh, just, you know, anytime in the next sort of five, 10 minutes, that'd be great. Um, and, you know, we welcome you back to experience this podcast next week. Um, and we'll see you in your ears next, next week, week if you pay your bill by subscribing. Thank you.